Hey, this is Walter Jones. This is Austin St. John. And you're listening to Ranger Danger. Go, go, Ranger Danger. All right, welcome once again to Mighty Morphin Ranger Danger. This is the podcast where we watch episodes of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and then afterwards, and often before, we talk about Power Rangers. It's a pretty high concept. My name is Matt. Michael is here as always. Hey, guys. And today we have a very special guest as well. He's a comics writer. For DC Comics, he's written Batman in series like Batman Eternal and Gates of Gotham. He's written ongoing series about Deathstroke the Terminator, and he had a long run, which I absolutely adored on Nightwing. He's also written a short film called The League, available on iTunes, and an ongoing series called Cal, now available on Comicsology, both about a superhero labor union in 1960s Chicago. But most importantly, for the purposes of our podcast, he's the writer of Boom Studios' new ongoing Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comic, with its zero issue coming out in January. Please welcome Mr. Kyle Higgins to the show. Welcome, Kyle. Hey, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. That was a uh, pretty fantastic introduction, if I, uh, if I can say that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate Am that. Am I allowed to say that Matt rehearsed it three or four times? I definitely did. I'm a little <laughs> nervous. Not going to lie. I wanted to make sure I had it down. No, you, uh, you killed it, man. It was great. I um, did. The first time I did it, because I was writing it on my iPhone, I actually had... Mm-hmm. It autocorrect to from superhero to superb, so it was almost a superb well, reunion, which I think that'd well, be a great comic too. I love. I, I, superb I would be. I would read that book. <laughs> <I'm> glad, <laughs> but we should probably talk to you a bit about Power Rangers since that's what is on the horizon for you and for us in January. Sure. So, well, did you watch Power Rangers when you were younger? Was that the experience that you had with it first? I've actually never heard of Power Rangers before this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was a pretty big, I was a pretty big fan when I was younger. Um, it came out, uh, and I was I was eight years old. I was in third grade, and um, I don't know that I actually saw Day of the Dumpster first. I feel like my memory is that I saw. Um, oh God, I'm terrible. I'm terrible with episode names too, so you'll have to forgive me. Well, that's right. Um, to all the Ra- Power Ranger fans America out there, well. I'm sorry in <laughs> advance. Um, there, uh, the episode with uh, with the with the pudgy pig, yeah, uh, food fight. That's it. Food fight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I knew it was that too. I almost said that, but I didn't want to sound like a total. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Believe kid. me, on this podcast, I'm allowed to be the guy who remembers the names of Power Rangers episodes. <laughs> Good, my friend, because I might be. I'm going to be hitting you up for that. <laughs> Uh, can I? By the way, what's what is our what is our um, our age range on this podcast? As Are far you allowed as to swearing? If you'd like to. Oh, swear. thank fucking god! Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to sound like an asshole throwing out food fight and then being like, "It." Well, actually, it's that's not the title of the episode, but uh, but apparently it was. So yeah. that was the first episode that I remember seeing, um, and uh, it that, was just it was a. So that it was, was a Saturday morning a thing. giant pig eating everything. Like, you don't forget that very easily. <laughs> no, no, you don't. <laughs> and, like, we had, like, this was an era before, this was obviously before the internet was, I mean, the internet was around, but it wasn't, I don't think I knew anyone, I'd never heard of it, I didn't know what it was. Um, but, uh, so there was no, like, there was no kind of warning, and there was nowhere you could go to figure out, like, what the hell did I just watch, you know? Yep, yep. Um, I don't even know that if I if I saw I don't even know that I saw commercials before it. I think I just turned it on on a Saturday morning on Fox Kids, and my sister and I watched it, and we're like, "Whoa, I don't know what that is, but it's pretty cool." Um, and uh, and and yeah, so it just kind of started from there, and then just I would watch episodes um, every day, and then I feel like a short time later, uh, it wasn't that much long after the series had pre- either premiered or I had, you know, obviously food fight wasn't an early, it was an early episode, but yeah. it wasn't, there were a bunch before it. So, so my timeline might be actually might be accurate. I started seeing promos for, um, uh, the green with evil, you know, mini series. And yeah. they were like running it as in the U S as like an event that was going to happen starting on Monday. And I remember where I was when I saw the first commercial, and <laughs> it was like I had like I think we were we had a babysitter watching us, but we had like a, a like a like a um, we had friends over and stuff, and it was like we saw that commercial and was like a, an evil Power Ranger. What is that? I don't know what that is, but that sounds awesome. 
And, uh, and so that was like, you know, and then obviously the, the Green Ranger saga and, and everything was a, a long running thread on the show. And, yeah. um, anyway, so I'm rambling here. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, you were watching from very early is I think the takeaway there. And when would you say you kind of, you know, got away from the show? Um, well, it, it was weird. The first season ran for a long time. Yeah. Um, and there was never any like clear delineation for when the season stopped, at least when I was eight anyway. And so what would happen is because it ran every day, sometimes you'd get a new episode, sometimes you'd get a rerun. Yep. And they never really felt like they connected. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they did. But just the schedule, the scheduling, from what I remember anyway, was was such that like you would get new episodes, but then you get a new episode, and then the next day would be a rerun. It, yep. it was kind of weird, and so. Um, but I would tape episodes, and I I watched pretty faithfully the whole first season, and then um, I remember it was airing on like a Sunday night or something, and I had like. And I only knew that from TV Guide. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. And so I just, I was going on vacation with my family. And so I set the, re- the VCR to record it. And while I was on vacation, um, I, I was in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm actually, um, I'm a big Neil Gaiman fan as well. Oh, and so I, both. yeah. So what I remember from this trip was that this was the first time I went to House on the Rocks, which oh, yeah. became very prominent in American Gods, yep. uh, you know, 10 years later. And so I, we do this whole tour and everything. And we happen to go buy like a Toys R Us or, or or something, or maybe it was just like a Target up in Wisconsin. And um, and on the shelves, all of a sudden, it's like they had the green, like the, the Dragon Dagger. They had okay. they had um, the the uh, the Power Blaster. They had all these toys that like had been impossible to find for you know the entire year before. Yep. And. Um, and I was like, oh, I have to get, I have to get this, and and so you know, I leveraged, uh, I made a, some sort of agreement with my parents for allowance money in advance or something <laughs> uh, to get the Dragon Dagger, and then there was this Zord that was, um, it, it it ended up being um, the Thunder Zord, the Jason's uh, Thunder Zord, yep. but I didn't know what it was, and. Right. It was like, I guess this is a thing. Maybe I missed an episode. I don't know. And so, but I bought that as well. And then we got home either that night or the next, the next night. And I checked the VCR and, um, it was the mutiny. Oh, and wow. so, so it had just aired and these were the toys like, well, the Thunder Zord in particular was, was being put out, um, in conjunction with, I guess now in hindsight, it was the second season starting. Yep. And so, so, so I watched that stuff, and I watched all of the, um, you know, Tommy losing his powers for good, and then I kind of drifted during the second season. But I would come back, and you know, I saw the White Ranger stuff, and then, um, but by that point, it had been like I was in fourth grade, and it, I don't know if it was like this for you guys, but like a, a, here a switch flipped like overnight and like all of a sudden it was like super unpopular to be a power rangers fan in fourth grade yeah and i think, I think you're right it's a combination of it sort of dwindling in popularity a little bit and then you, you age out of it yeah. as well and yeah the combination of those two things is a, it can be a bit lethal to your fandom but i was a huge i was a huge comic book fan as well or well, superhero fan i should say i i read comics sporadically uh, when I could find them, like at yep. the grocery stores, et cetera. But this, again, was – it was the same problem with Power Rangers episodes where at that time Marvel was publishing stories, Spider-Man stories across four Spider-Man books. So mm-hmm. trying to follow the story, uh, you know, as a kid when you were only finding epi- like random issues at, you know, Dominic's or wherever, the supermarket, um, was really tough. So you'd find things here or there. Um, but I was a big fan of like, you know, the, the Spider-Man, um, I think it was on at that time, uh, the Spider-Man animated series and the mm-hmm. X-Men animated series and Batman, obviously it was yeah. a huge fan yeah. of the Batman animated series. So Power Rangers to me was definitely kind of still in that like sweet spot. And I had like my, f- like a couple, like my really good friends, my sister's three years younger than me. And so I had like my next door neighbor was three years younger. He was like my best friend growing up. So I was still like, I maintained kind of a fandom, like a Power Rangers fandom, just through 
like there were people a few years younger than me that were still really into it. Yep. And so it was cool. It was okay for me to, you know, um, to like, I could still be a fan like with, you know, through and with them. Um, but at school, like I just didn't talk about it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we know what that's like, I think. Yeah, it was hard enough fitting in uh, at school. <laughs> then to add on top of that, uh, you know, something that was unpopular, you know, you just didn't, you just don't really talk about it. So yeah. so do you think Power Rangers in any way led to you getting into comics? Like there was there some connection there? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I never wanted to get into comics, um, it, like period, which is really weird to say now yeah. because there were definitely moments kind of especially in like my teenage years where it was like I, I i was really into comics and reading a lot and knew i wanted to make movies etc and people would say like the comic store that i went to the um the gentleman who ran it who's one of my very good friends now um because i've known him forever uh he was a he was a writer and he runs moonstone comics or moonstone books yep. and they do comics and prose and so he would you know he was publishing stuff and, um, and writing other things. And, and so I was aware that like, this is a job that people do and we would have conversations about it. And like, I kind of dabbled at, at drawing for a long time. And, and so it was like, Oh, maybe I could draw comics, but I never thought about writing them. Um, because it just didn't seem like something I'd be good at. And I didn't know enough of like how the world worked or how do people come up with stories? Like in hindsight, I actually wrote, I've been writing since second grade and some of the earliest things I wrote were actually, I wrote, I did like power Rangers fan films when I was, <laughs> <So cool. laughs> when I was like seven and eight years old or eight and nine years old, I was making actually from the time I was seven, I was doing little films that with my sister and I would act in and like, we'd make the costumes and then my dad would, my dad's a photographer as well. And so right. he would vi videotape all this and like, He'd teach me about like shots and like the cut, you know, and uh, and um, so we did like a, some Superman ones and some Ninja Turtle ones, and then we did a big Power Rangers one that I brought all my friends in for, and like we built like a command center in our basement, oh, and wow. we built like we had these two Rubbermaid like trash trash cans, like big like rolling ones, yep. and they were like um, kind of a slate gray blue, and so I stacked them on top of each other, and then I've never told this story by the way. I stacked them on top of each other and I drew with a Sharpie, a Zordon face on the one. Is there and then, any chance that this film still exists somewhere? Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it since we made it. Um, but uh, I bet, I bet the next time I'm in Chicago, I'll try to dig it out because it's on old like high eight tapes. Yep. So I'd have to digitize it, but um, I mean, but it's totally like doable. Now that we've heard about it. You owe it to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> I, I so badly yeah, want to see this totally... either way. Like, even if it's just like we see it and then we never show anyone else. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this in every way. Well, and and what what I remember is that we, I remember making like helmets out of. Um, "Quote unquote helmets out of brown paper bags and then coloring them with crayon <laughs> so for different good. colored rangers, and then um, and then what else did we do? Oh, that was the yeah. So to do the Zords in like our upstairs, like in our like bonus room in our house, like our playroom, we had like big. There were big elements like, for example, like the I remember like the old like toy chest um, was actually like a yellow school bus." And it was right. big enough that, like, as a kid, you could get into it. So that became a Zord, you know. And then there were other things like that. And we would actually shoot almost like stop motion with these big things as I and put them closer and closer together and then stack them on top of each other. So it was as if the Zords were, you know, forming into, like, a Megazord type thing. Um, That's incredibly creative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, looking back on it now, it's definitely, the, the seeds were definitely there for, for directing and for writing and, yeah. um, and, and yeah. And so ultimately it's not really, it's not really a surprise looking in hindsight that that's kind of the path I went. Um, but the way I got started writing comics was because of a film that I directed. Actually the film that you guys mentioned in the opening, yep. uh, the league is something that I also directed. And then that got certain people at Marvel's attention and they, 
they were like, this is pretty cool. Do you ever want to write comics, essentially? And it was a little more complicated than that, but sure. um, I was like, well, I'm not going to say no to that opportunity. So, sure, I'll pitch some stuff. And then it just kind of turned into this whole other thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. so in preparation for writing Power Rangers, have you been going back and re-watching? I have. Um, yeah, it's it's been an interesting process because – Every once in a while over the last few years, I've gotten like a kick, gotten on a kick about Power Rangers where it's like, man, I wonder what, you know, I wonder what happened after, you know, whatever point or, um, you know, st- like this, when I was, I was aware, I should say, I was aware of the storylines through Turbo. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then, and I would check in every once in a while just to see like, what was going on, you know? Um, and obviously I saw the movies and then, um, and then it, the, 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 um, the second power transfer happened during turbo. Uh, was it the second or third? I guess it was the second. Um, I think second. Yeah. Second probably. Yep. Um, and then after turbo, it went to, uh, Rangers in space, right? Yes. So that's where I, I didn't have any, all of a sudden I turned into, you know, turned the TV on one day and was flipping through the channels, and all of a sudden they were in outer space, and it was a whole new cast, and I was like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of like the, my end point of like having any awareness of, of things. But every once in a while, over the years, I'd be like, I wonder what... So what actually happened? And it'd be like late at night, and I'd be on YouTube, like looking up like, you know, fucking interviews with people and, <laughs> and like recap episodes and things like that. So like I've kind of... And my roommate would come in and be like, oh, Power Rangers again? Okay. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and so I would watch episodes here or there. And, um, you know, they're they're not easy to get through uh, no. going back on them. You know, you kind of have to watch them um, from a vantage point of, like, more from nostalgia and personal nostalgia, at least for me. No, I'm um, definitely with you on that. It certainly... Towards the end of that first season too, there's big long stretches where it's the same episode over and over and over again, and it can be a real slog to get through that. Yeah, what's what's frustrating about it is like I understand all the limitations of the production, yeah. um, or at least the limitations that we're aware of. I'm sure there are even more um, that we don't know about. Yeah, but um, but I'm I'm aware of a lot of the limitations and what they were trying to do with what they had. The frustrating thing for me is like there are still things that it's like it didn't need to be there are there are elements that did not need to be that bad. Yes, <laughs> you know, like absolutely. <laughs> like there are certain writing elements and certain you know, um there are just certain things that it's like, oh man, that just doesn't there's a better way to do that, you know. Um, That's a sentence that we have said on this podcast at least once an episode, I would say, for the past two years. So <laughs> yeah and i think but it, it's oh, sorry, that it's not that they didn't have the resources they're just these tiny moments of laziness like there'll be a special sword that appears in last week's episode and then in this week's episode they get the name of the sword wrong it's like it wouldn't yeah. cost you anything more just to go back and check the footage and to see what you called it last week or check the script but they, yeah they and, just and it's invested and it's super confusing too like how things work and um, that's the thing that I've actually, <laughs> I've been with become, <laughs> yeah, very aware of working on the book is like just the power grid or the morphing, the morphing grid or the power grid. Yeah. And so Kyle, is, what is the morphing grid? It, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there are uh, different interpretations, um, yeah. but then different things where like, you know, the crystals mm-hmm. that power the Zords are different from the the power coins yes. which are different from the morphing grid you know yes and like and then it's like you have to i don't know it's just but then their powers are tied I, you know sometimes <laughs> their powers are tied to the morphing grid but other times their powers are tied to the coins it, it's just very it's very it's not clean you know <laughs> it, it's very vague and open to interpretation we've talked before a lot about what exactly their powers are after they morph because yeah. the show certainly tries to get you to believe that once they're morphed, they're a lot stronger. But if you take putties, for example, they seem to have about the same level of effectiveness fighting putties before and after morph, except that sometimes they That's have That's a weapons. great point. 
it's a, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, yeah, it's nebulous. I mean. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I always took took it to be that like their powers when they're in full on ranger in in full on ranger mode, like they definitely have more defensive capabilities. Like Certainly. they can take more kind of battle damage. Yep. Um, and that might just be a product of you know the Japanese footage. Obviously, has so many great like um squib hits and stuff yes, and so. and practical effects on the suits and you don't get that in the american footage with uh especially with the actors without costumes yeah um but it does create or or created at least as a kid for me like the sense that like wow like the damage they're taking there's no it's a good thing they're in they're in ranger mode because they wouldn't be able to take it you know as in normal human mode um for lack of a better term. It's but, fascinating uh, to me too that the technical limitations of the show do as much world building for, than <laughs> as the writers did, I guess. Mm-hmm. Because uh, all, all we can take from sort of the aspects of the show that aren't explicitly stated is what we see on screen, which is almost universally dictated by resource decisions. So it's, yeah, it's very right. to me that that's where we've gotten to with it. Well, that's kind of one of the cool things with the book that, that I'm doing. Um, there, there are a lot of like areas and avenues that the show just wasn't really able to explore yeah. um, or go down. Um, I don't know that we've ever really seen the inside of a Zord, you know, other than cockpit mode. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> you should see the look on Michael's face just then. His eyes lit up. So <laughs> you've hooked him already. That sentence has made me incredibly excited very quickly. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I, I said this in an interview at New York, uh, Comic-Con, like I am not, I'm not someone who's going to tell a story just to like provide answers for continuity questions or little things like that. Like mm. what's, I'm going to do a story that shows the inside of his Zord for the sake of showing you the inside of his Zord. I kind of feel like that's a bullshit reason to do a story, to tell a story. Absolutely. Um, but if there are avenues to show different things and explore different things like i well i don't even want to say that because it'd be a big spoiler um yeah, we but, don't, we don't but that. we're very excited for the book so we don't want to spoil <laughs> <laughs> but things like yeah like maybe just the way that this this you know the sequence goes down we actually do track through the inside of a zord i'm all about it yeah. because we haven't seen it and we have we don't have the limitations that the show had as far as budget and logistics okay. so you know, and that's kind of, that's my background. I mean, if you look at the stuff I've done at DC, like the, the, the best kind of example is probably like my Batman Beyond 2.0 stuff where it's a continuation of the show, but it's also kind of its own thing, you know, like it's, Absolutely. it's very, yeah, it's, it's very much in, in line with the spirit of the original cartoon without being too, um, without being too, uh, bound to it, I guess is, is the best way to put it. Um, so with this, with the book, like, you know, it, it's ta- it, does, it does take place in 2015, you know, um, yep. and it takes place after Tommy has become the Green Ranger. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of like Archie in the way, like the modern Archie reboot that, um, that they're doing right now with, with uh, Mark and Fiona, where um, it's the characters that you know and love and all the things that make them who you know them to be and... and uh, but it's in a more modern kind of setting, um, which, you know, I mean, that interests me. It may not be for everyone, uh, which I totally get, but, um, I wasn't as into the idea of doing like a straight nineties nostalgia book personally. Um, so, you know, this is the route kind of, we're going with it. So yeah, and I think that's sort of what interested Michael and myself, especially because there have been Power Rangers comics in the past. There was almost yes. one by... Uh, who, who was Rob it? Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld. The almost Young Blood crossover. Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah, it was a Zio issue, and I believe it was drawn by uh, Todd Nock. Yep. Yeah. And I keep, I'm, I'm actually pretty good friends with Todd. I keep meaning to ask him what happened, uh, but I, I keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was a crazy era of comics. Yeah, I believe of comics could have exploded is what happened. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, g- going back to the characters for a moment, because we're very excited for the series. Obviously, we don't want to know what happens, but. The characters is something that I'm really keen to get into, especially because when you're writing Nightwing, mm-hmm. the how well you seem to know Dick Grayson and get into his mind was what really grabbed me. So 
Is there any of the characters that you feel especially you have that sort of connection with or that you have a, a good understanding of? Jason and Billy probably are the best okay. uh, or, the, or for me, just from, from personal kind of life experience stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and just from just who I was at that age, you know, yeah. um, Jason's who I, I wanted to be. <laughs> Billy was a little bit closer to who I was. Um, it, it, in, in so far as, you know, there was, Billy had some social awkwardness um, mm-hmm. and some insecurity, but he was a genius. You know, I, yeah. I would not say I was a, <laughs> as a genius or anything like that, but I definitely was more on the book side of things. And I was definitely more, um, I don't know, I, I was more, a little more introverted and, and intellectual. And, um, and uh, you know, actually, Billy had like a pretty amazing arc throughout the series where he definitely grew and he definitely became a little bit more, he definitely became more confident and he became more, you know, of an extrovert in some ways. Um, his fighting improved. I mean, he definitely had a lot of development if, over the course of the whole series. Um, sorry, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, it's interesting that you say that because uh, obviously you don't want to do a book that's just filling continuity holes. It should be its own thing. But you've also got these characters that went on to have experiences and developments long after when the book is set within the mythos. So how much are you sort of uh, t- trying to get the characters to those places of what they become or how much are you trying to take them in a new direction? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that in a lot of ways who they are in the book um, is predicated on where in the kind of timeline of the show sure. I'm jumping off from. Yep. So if if I'm saying like my book takes place after – it takes place right after Tommy has become the Green Ranger. It's after, you know, Green with Evil. Okay. S- but he is the, he is now the Green Ranger and he's a part of the team. Yep. Um, that's kind of the jumping off point. I'm basically using that as the status quo of the book, mm-hmm. but in this modern kind of interpretation that I'm doing or that we're doing. That's really um, so the characters are updated versions of who they were at that point in time in the series. Um and by, when I say updated, I mean more aesthetically and, and just language-wise and sure. things like that. I mean, this isn't 1993. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no overalls is what you're saying? <laughs> no overalls, no. <laughs> um, I think more than anything, honestly, the biggest, the biggest for, for long-time Power Ranger fans, the biggest kind of, the, the, mo- the, the thing that will be the most jarring is, is, mo- is um, or not, jarring is not the right word. Um, the biggest update is more in the aesthetic and the visuals. Um, just as it, just as far as like, what does the high school look like? What do the clo- what do the clothes look like that people are wearing? Things like that, you know. Um, yeah, I so. think having read the first little bits of the Archie reboot as well, I'm certainly very keen to see what that version of that is for the Power Rangers because I think we've had the Power Rangers before. Uh, and like we've had so many episodes of that that I think we do need a new spin. We can't just keep going back and rehashing it. So it'll be exciting. So what about the others? Like what? The, like we've got Trini and mm-hmm. and Zach. Do you think that because they are quite thinly drawn, especially because they left before right. the others? Is there right. much there? Was there much there for you to hook on to and build characters off of? Oh yeah. I mean, I think yeah. And I don't want to get too much into it here, but. Um, this is a uh, the way I've been describing this book is that it's it's a serialized it's a big serialized story mm-hmm. um, that focuses on these six people. So even though you know like the zero issue and, and a lot of the kind of like the way into the series, I've been describing it as um, focusing on the Green Ranger. It is insofar as like that's our way into the world and him becoming a Power Ranger is kind of where the series starts. Yep. Um, but these these other five Rangers are they're they're all the leads of this book, you know. So e- everyone has kind of their own story and has their own um, subplot and focus that'll be put on them. And it, it's something that I've gotten um, I've gotten pretty good at, to be honest. Um, it's just yep. something I've done a lot of in Cowl. Cowl, we had. I mean, eight, nine, eight or nine leads sometimes in that in that book, and so you juggle a lot of subplots and things interweave. And sometimes people are together, and sometimes they're not. Um, and and their stories come together or cross paths, you know. 
Um, and I, I the, one of the very first things I wrote was Gates of Gotham. And it was like, a, you know, that was like six or seven lead book. And everyone had their own thing going on. Um, and it just becomes a plotting kind of um, an issue of plotting and just keeping track of everyone's arc and how it connects and to everyone else's arc and also how it feeds into what the overall kind of point of the story is thematically or emotionally, you know? Um, so, so yeah, as far as like Trini and Zach and, and, um, and Kim and everyone really has, has something that I'm, they all have something I'm exploring. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the stuff like with, with them is new, uh, as far as, just what we saw of them on the show. Um, you know, I don't know that we ever really saw anyone's parents other than the one episode. Nope. Um, Kim so had an uncle or something, but who was the same as her dad or <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, so some of that stuff, you know, in the home life, um, I'll tell you what interests me the most is, um, and, and it's something that the show did a little bit of, but um, it's the Peter, it's the Peter Parker Spider Man kind of aspect yeah. of, or the possibility of being a superhero and juggling your your regular life in high school life and the, all the drama of high school with the drama of and the pressures of having to save the world. That's really powerful stuff, and there's a lot to mine there dramatically. Um, and that was the thing that I mean. That's that's why I love. That's why I grew up as such a big Spider-Man fan because you see yourself in uh, in Peter Parker, but then you see who you really like to be. Um, there's there's kind of like the wish fulfillment aspect of Spider-Man, and to me, the Power Rangers are they they strike those same chords. Um, so th- there's going to be a lot of that as well, and um, and that's something that Boom is like really really supportive of, and that's actually that was one of the big reasons why the fact that Boom hooked up with Saban to do this series was the reason that I reached out and yeah. said, you know, I would love, I'd love to, I'd be, I'd, I'd really love to put together a pitch for this. Um, just because I know, I know the people at boom. Um, and I know that creatively and aesthetically what their books, what they do mm-hmm. and what their books are like and, you know, stuff that takes place in that kind of age range, uh, character wise, uh, in high school, like, Boom's really good at it, yeah. And um, they're very progressive in that way, and and I think that's to me that's really interesting for um, for something like Power Rangers. Very much so. And you know, we were going to ask you for a bit of a tease of the series coming up, but I don't think anything you could say now could get me more excited than what you've just said. So I think probably <laughs> no. I mean, I, between that sentence and the inside of a Zord, yeah, I, I think we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> can I just can I just buy every issue right now and just save myself in trouble? You can actually pre-order the series, Michael. Can I? You totally can. You yeah. sure can. So we're going to have a, a page up on our site, which will be rangedangerpodcast.com slash comic, which will have instructions on where to find your local comic book store, how to pre-order. Uh, all the details you need to pre-order the series. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't, um, who isn't, you know, doesn't read comics or doesn't read them regularly, just so you guys, so they understand, yeah, like the way that the comic, the way the comic book industry works is that it's it's very much um, driven by pre-orders. So what happens is that a book is solicited in um, in a publication called Previews. So all the publishers list their books that are going to be coming out three months from now, for example, right? And uh, so right now, the the issue of previews that is out is for January of 2016. And it goes to all the comic book stores. And then uh, people at the comic book store can also get a copy of previews as well. And they look through and see, oh, what's coming out in January? And then the store will basically order however many copies of the book they think they can sell. But it's taking a shot in the dark, Mm -hmm. really. Um, what, what's best is when customers come and tell their store, I'd like a copy of this. I'd like to pre-order this or put this on my pull list. And then the store counts all those numbers. And then that determines how many copies they think they can sell. You know what I mean? Like they can kind of parse it out from there. So, um, it's, it's kind of like one of those weird quirks of publishing where, you know, comics aren't returnable. So store owner, or I shouldn't say that, in, a, in most cases, comics are not returnable. So stores are kind of left with this very thin margin for error 
as far as how many copies they'll order of something. And then depending on how many copies are ordered, that determines the print run of the book. So if you want, if you're, you're interested in the book and you have a local comic shop or you have always thought about going to a local comic shop, uh, now is a great time uh, to, to go tell your shop that uh, you know, you'd like to check the series out. Um, so that's my, that's my plug for comics. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, as you said, it, it is so important that retailers and Boom subsequently get the message that there's so many people out there that are excited for it. So we would love it. I'm sure Kyle would love it if as soon as you stop listening to this podcast. In fact, while you're listening. That's right. You could multitask. <laughs> you, go and pre-order Power Rangers Zero and let them know that you're interested. Yeah. And I should say, the, the other thing that I would add is um, I'm just getting art back in from Hendry uh, Prisetia. I think that's how you say his last name. Yep. And it's cool. It's really cool. Uh, it's definitely, like, his character designs, I've, I've seen all the designs for the Rangers. I've seen the designs for um, some of our villains, some of our new villains, um, <laughs> and uh, old and new alike. And they're they're pretty neat. Um, the, Hendry, I, I knew his stuff a little bit from... Um, power girl that he did at dc years earlier and just he's a he's a really dynamic storyteller um and uh, what excites me the most looking at his pages is that there's he has such a um he has such latitude in what he can draw that when i say something like you know we're gonna do the inside of a zord or we're gonna do you know uh, I, oh God, there's one. There's something I want to say, but it's so late, and I'm not going to say it. Uh, it, it, it it's really something cool, though. Cool. It's a it's a really big visual, and it was like, oh yeah, he can totally do this. Um, so that's pretty exciting for me because yeah, yeah. the other thing, like all of the character drama and all the character interactions and relationships that we're talking about, that are incredibly important to me and interesting, is half of it. The other half is that this is a big action adventure book and you got to be able to do that. I mean, you're talking huge Zords battling in, you know, in the ocean and in Angel Grove and um, you got to be able to, you got to have scope to your work, you know, um, in order to, to, to pull that off. And Hendry totally does. So it's going to be a fun time, I think. That's yeah. It sounds like a fun time to me. Yeah. All right, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you very much, Kyle, for joining us. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. We're very excited to read the book. Yeah, oh, I did not think I could be more excited, and <laughs> I am now so much more excited. <laughs> well, good. thanks, guys. I appreciate the time and uh, and uh, for for all of the early support. No worries. Thanks again, Kyle. All right. Take care. Wow, that was something. Holy shit. (laughs) Uh, I'd like to say before we go any further, thank you to listener Corbin, who on Twitter tweeted to Kyle Higgins and said, hey, you should be in the show. Yep. For basically making that happen. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't underplay how many emails I've sent in the past month and a half. But yeah, Yeah. absolutely. That's Thank you very much, Corbin. Thank you, Corbin. uh, more people should tweet at people that they should be on our podcast because it turns out we can just make that happen. Yeah, we keep saying that when you leave five star reviews or tweet to people and stuff like that, it's good for the podcast. Uh, and that, I think that was one of the best examples yet of how you guys can help us get bigger and better and cooler and do awesome things. Yeah, we we just tweeted that we were really excited. Yeah, uh, someone else tweeted, "Hey, wanted to try and get him on the show," and then he tweeted back, "That'd be cool." And uh, then we just did that interview. Yeah. Now, we should probably move on, or I'll just keep gushing for the yeah, next 20 minutes. I mean, we took a break after recording that to check that it was all okay and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, we've been gushing the whole time. <laughs> uh, we'd lo- I mean, we've got to thank Kyle as well. For Absolutely. Thank you very much. For coming on the show. Thank and- you very much to Kyle Higgins. And thank you also to Mel at Boom, who I've been liaising with. He, you know, could have said, no, you guys can't have an interview, but... He was very happy to make it happen. So yeah. uh, go pre-order the goddamn comic, guys. Do it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Me too. I was already very excited, and then he said some very exciting things. Yes. But everyone's heard the interview, so let's move on. We have an episode of Power Rangers to watch today. Yes, man. Episode 108. Yes, yeah, Storybook Rangers Part 1, I yeah. believe. Uh, will they get like sucked into a storybook, maybe? I mean, uh, I kind of expect so, but maybe that's too much to ask for. I don't know. 
I'm kind of, I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't either. Before we get to that, though, I should tell you we have a website. Yep. www.rangedangerpodcast.com, which is where you can find show notes and uh, our Range Danger creature feature, which is our list of the monsters. All sorts of cool stuff is on there. You can also contact us on Twitter. We're at RangerDcast on Twitter. We love getting emails. RangerDangerPodcast.com. Nope. Let's try that again. Ranger... Ranger Danger Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Plus, uh, Hulu. We're not on Hulu. <laughs> Hulu's for TV shows. Um, we have a shop. Ranger Danger Podcast.com slash shop. Thank you for saving the, me there, Michael. That's My okay. brain has been fried by the interview, apparently. You've done 130 of these, Matt. It's only fair that I do one occasionally. <laughs> Okay, so before we go watch the episode, we have a bit of Power Rangers related news to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even go so far as to call it news. I would call it a rumour. Okay. Um, there's news that there's a rumour. Yeah, or there's a rumour that there's news. Yes. Uh, so there's been news on the Power Rangers movie front. Yes. Uh, we will have already discussed that in this week's Dino Charge episode. So yep. you guys have heard all that already. If you haven't, you can go check that out. But there was also a rumour from one of the sources of some of that rumoured news, uh, Collider, that potentially the next season of Power Rangers after Supercharge could be produced by and aired on Netflix. Um, so here's the other thing I've heard about that rumour. Yep. Is that uh, apparently someone said on Ranger Board yep. that it was being spread by a banned Ranger Board user who was just trying to... Stir up nonsense. Right. Um, so, yeah, the rumour is that the next season will be called Power Rangers Shuriken. Yep. Uh, it will skip Tokuga and go straight to Ninja. Um, and, yeah, it will be a 32-episode season on Netflix. Here's the thing. Yep. Kids can't say Shuriken. Okay. I don't... That's the one you're going for? Yeah, I just, to me, that's kind of, yeah, the bit that makes me question it most. Because like, if you look at the names of the series, yes. they're always very easy to say, very little, literal, very descriptive, yep. short, punchy words. Power Rangers Shuriken sounds like something that a fan would call this season. Yeah, I mean, there also haven't been many one word. There's Zeo and Turbo. Turbo. Yeah. But I feel uh, RPM is... It's three words. Know, <laughs> three words or one word. Yeah. One, like, so is SPD, but... Really, that Power Rangers something something yep. is how they've been for a long time. Um, here's the reason that I don't think that it's real. Yep, um, it's what I want to happen. Okay, and I know that sounds like Michael doesn't think that anything good will ever happen on the show, <laughs> but like, if you said to me, Michael, what's like, what's the thing that you want most out of the next season? I'd say, well, you'd move it to Netflix because Nick don't care about it. You skip the trains one. You go to the ninja one. It just, it seems too obvious. I mean, I don't want them to skip trains, but... They're going <laughs> to skip trains. The thing about it, to me too, is that Netflix is a pretty ideal platform for most forms of media, yep. of franchise media. But Power Rangers as a business, yep. makes money from merchandise. Yep. Netflix potentially limits the amount of people who can see it because it's not on broadcast. Yes. And I think that might limit its merchandising capabilities. Yes, I certainly would understand that. So it might be a bad business decision. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, Nickelodeon have proven that they don't really care about Power Rangers. Yep. Um, between the, like, the scheduling fuck-ups with this year's Christmas and Halloween specials and the dumb big hiatus that stops everyone from giving a shit about Power Rangers for six months. It's just Nickelodeon are are using it as a schedule filler. It's not like one of their priorities, clearly. But, yeah, I don't know that Netflix is better. They do... Uh, Netflix has been moving into getting some of its own children's program. Yes. Like, I know they did Richie Rich recently. Yep. Which is apparently awful, but I don't think that's Netflix's fault necessarily. So, it, yeah, it's not outside of the realm of possibility. No, it's absolutely not. The- Especially because they've had all 20-something seasons of Power Rangers on Netflix. Yep. It's entirely possible that someone could look at those numbers and go, hey, kids love watching Power Rangers. Yep. Can we just... Like, can we just buy Power Rangers? Yep. 
especially if they're looking to grow that area of the business and they're just not even looking for they're like, not that the show jumped out at them they're just looking for some properties to build mm. then maybe they oh and easy. having like a name brand with movie coming out soon. movie coming up and kind of buzz building it would be i think it would be good for them yeah i don't know how good it would be for power rangers i think whatever netflix would be paying them yep. would have to be enough that saban is willing to take a cut on the merchandising yeah i mean yeah who kn- and who knows what that like maybe it actually brings power rangers to a lot more people i don't know what the difference is between nickelodeon's install base and netflix's you know what though it might be that it's easier for them to get international, internationally yes. a higher amount of people because rather than doing deals with individual networks around the world they give it to netflix done yeah yeah. You say Nickelodeon can have it in America even. Yeah. But outside America, instead of making a deal with like Gem or whoever it is that shows it here, yep. it's just on Netflix everywhere else. Yeah. Something to that. The other interesting thing is this 32 episode season thing. Mm. 32 episodes was like the standard length of a Power Rangers season for quite a while. Yeah. They've gone either down to 20 or up to 40 these days. Does anyone have Depending on how you look at it. I think up to 40. I mean, realistically, Dino Charge is two years long. Yeah. And it's 40 episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 32 would be slightly fewer episodes. On one level, it gives them more latitude to cut bits and play around with bits and not use weird episodes. On the other level, it's an extra eight or nine episodes worth of footage that you're not really using at all. Do you think that it would be, or and I don't know if this is covered in the rumor, if that would be thirty-two episodes a year as opposed to forty over two? The rumor says thirty-two. I can't imagine they do like two thirty-two episode seasons. Yeah, because then that's actually fourteen episodes more than a Power Rangers season, and there's no way they're going to shoot twelve original episodes. Unless Netflix pays a lot of money. Yeah. Which, you which know, isn't actually I, a lot of money. It would be like 12 cents. <laughs> it does override a lot of things, that money. That's, the, the thing about it is it is entirely plausible. Yeah. But given that it's coming on the heels of this other rumour that Collider have reported yep. that appears at the moment to be false, yep. potentially, I think until we get an official... Power Rangers Netflix press release. I don't think there's any particular reason to assume it's happening. No. No, I, I'd agree with you there. All right, well, how about we go watch an episode of Power Rangers? Yeah, Storybook Rangers. Storybook Rangers. Do you think Sucked Into? Or maybe Monster comes out of a storybook? I think Sucked Into, just because of the construct of the name of the episode. Yeah. But I'm not sure. I'm excited to see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And really, five episodes left of the season, right? That's yep. pretty crazy. Yeah. Then we're on to ninjas and stuff, appropriately. Yeah. Continuing our conversation just then. Ninjas, I like ninjas. Most people do, Michael. Most people do. Let's do it. We're going to go watch Storybook Rangers Part 1. You can too, if you have Power Rangers on your Netflix. Uh, if not, maybe you have it on DVD. Or you could just listen to the episode without watching the episode of Power Rangers. Yeah, watch it in the theatre of the mind. <laughs> See you guys soon. And we're back. That was... That was interesting. Matt, we've seen some weird episodes of this show. This is pretty high up there. Oh my god. It raises so many questions. What? I can't... What? What? What the fuck? Should we take it for the top, or should we quickly address the issues that are troubling you most? Oh, I feel like if we... Oh my god. They get... No, we have to take it in order, because otherwise I'm just going to explode. Okay, we don't want that. Let's ease ourselves into it, in that case. So there's a book fair at Angel Grove High, Michael. Yeah. And books are available. Billy is very excited, because quantum physics can be fun, exclamation mark, yep. is available from the fair. Yep, he's been looking for it for ages, Matt. I think he's been looking for a way to convince other people that science is fun, 
and clearly been failing, so he turns to a science book to do it. I like to think that this is a long series of books called Incredibly Dorky Thing Can Be Fun. Yeah. He's like, he's got all the other, like, you know, aerodynamics can be fun and (laughs) calculus can be fun, but he was just missing quantum physics. Yeah, the first book is Collecting Books About Dorky Things Can Be Fun. (laughs) Kids read that and they're like, oh, they can be fun. I'm going to get the next one. Yeah. It's very clever, actually. Yeah. Uh, So, basically... If people buy books, yep. they raise money for the school library. There's a lot of book propaganda in this episode. Book bookaganda? No. I'm a fan of book propaganda. So, but look, I love books, so I'm okay with it, but it's very on the nose. I mean, look, if it was about, like, it's a Twinkie fair, yeah. and the more Twinkies you buy, the better it is for your school, it would be weird. That would be weird. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Aisha can't choose. There's lots of books. Um, one of her friends, I guess, comes over and says she has to check out the career table because there's a book about breaking into the fashion business. Is that something Aisha has been wanting before? Uh, vocally on the show? No. I don't, yeah, I don't remember that. I mean, we know she likes shopping. That's true. That's definitely on the record. It's not out of character. Yeah. It's just not, like, obviously in character. Sure. Uh, there's another book for sale at the fair, though, yes. that Bulk and Skull find. Yep. It's called How to Make Monsters the Easy Way or something like that. Making yeah. Monsters Made Easy? Yeah, Making Monsters Made Easy. <laughs> what? I, I have a question about what the actual book is. Because yeah, right? Obviously, the purpose of the book is not really important to the plot. No, they but... have to create a monster so there's a monster in this episode. Yes. But is it like monster costumes? Is it, like, monster effects for, for movies? Is it, like, a, bla- a book of black magic that will teach you to make an actual monster? It has to be costumes, surely? I mean, it's this universe. But they've got, like... The process involves 9-volt batteries and... Yeah, well, you know, wizards and witches have upgraded. Is, is it just about creating Frankensteins? Yeah. Is that Has someone just written a Frankenstein manual? Well, as I've said before, like, witches exist in this universe. Yeah, and sometimes they go to space and talk to skulls. Yeah. So maybe they one of them just put out a book. <laughs> so uh, Kimberly has always liked fairy tales. Matt. Yes. Um, she dreamed about being a princess being rescued by a prince on a white horse. Yep. Which is not very forward thinking of her, but... No. Yeah, we'll let that one slide. And Tommy says, how about a white tiger? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is almost flirting. Almost, which They're, is this is the closest they've been to being in a relationship for about sixty episodes. Yeah, and it's weird because previous to this, it was almost like they just decided to drop it. Both like the show writers, yes, and within the universe, those two as characters have decided this. We're not going to do this yeah. anymore. But they keep just slightly nudging it in a way that. It's weird because we know they're never going to do anything about it, right? Yeah. So we're what... certainly not going to get like a story of the first time they have sex. The, I, okay, I was, I was going to like go to first date, but that's oh, fine. okay. Well, I, I think that's not impossible. Power Rangers have been on dates on the show before. Yeah, I know. I just don't feel like they're ever going to do it with these two. Right? They're not going to fight like a herpes monster. No, herpes soul. <laughs> You're taking this to a very things. weird place. Yeah, that's my job on this podcast. <laughs> I thought that was my job. <laughs> We're trading. I can have a turn. Herpes saw. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so Bob Skull had that book, and yep. then Rocky finds a book about martial arts. Yep. To which Tommy says, "Can I read that book after you're done?" And before Rocky even manages to open his mouth, snatches the book out of Rocky's hands. It's about meditation, Matt. And just so, you know. starts reading it. And to me, that's the perfect representation of the relationship between those two characters. <laughs> right. Rocky gets something and he's like, this is cool. And Tommy's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. Yeah, that's for me now because I'm the leader of the Power Rangers. So, yeah. sorry, Red Ranger. Uh, so Kimberly finds a book that her dad used to read to her when she was a kid. Yep. It's called Grumble the Magic Elf. Yes, uh, Grumble is its name. That's not like a, a set an instruction. Yeah, it's not a command. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Tommy buys it for her. Yeah. And yeah, it's almost like they're actually dating on this show now. Yeah. Uh, are they? Could, if they're going to be, can they just 
be dating? Yeah. And if they're not going to be, can they not be date like? No, I understand. I'm with you. Yeah. What? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So there's a lot of book stuff yeah. happening. Uh, so on the moon, yep. Rita says, oh, this is very interesting. And we get Squat and Babu saying, I really hope she tells us what she's thinking because I've got no idea what's going on. Uh, Which is strange for them because all Rita ever does is tell people what she's thinking. I mean, look, let's be honest. The plan is going to involve attacking the Power Rangers. Yep. And using whatever she's looking at right now. Yep. So... You could probably piece it together yourself. Yes. Um, so she's going to zap the Power Rangers into a storybook. And then, once they're out of the way in the storybook, they can, you know, take over Angel Grove because the Power Rangers will be unavailable. Yep. Um, and Goldar comes up and he's like, you know, you're supposed to talk to Lord Zed about these things. And she calls him a 24-carat freak. Which is only half insult. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, shiny gold. Yeah, yeah, freak. But like, I've seen my lion face in the mirror. I'm aware that I'm not a, like a normal person. Yeah. Um, and she says, you know, Lord Zed's sleeping. I'm not going to interrupt him. This is this is how this is going to go down. And he's like, well, okay. I'd almost feel bad for Goldar being the one second between those two if it wasn't Goldar. Yeah, except it's, it, it is Goldar. Yeah. So Rocky comes up to Tommy and Kimberly yep. and says, hey, I'm going to the youth centre. I'm going to meet the other guys there. Do you guys want in? And they're like, yeah, sure. So they all, they leave to go meet them. I had imagined in my head yep. that the youth centre is incredibly close to the school. I was absolutely of that understanding too. Right. Except in this episode, they have to walk through the park. Yes. <sighs> Honestly, Michael, I think the youth centre is still right next to the high school. They just weren't <laughs> thinking about it in this episode, is the answer to this, to this conundrum that you're having. I still think our greater model of the Angel Grove layout works, which is that the high school yeah. and the youth centre are at the dead centre of town, mm-hmm. and then there's a ring of park, yep. and then there's the rest of the town. Yeah. So anytime you want to go to either the youth centre or the high school, you have to pass through Park. But if you're going between those two things, Park is not required. So maybe what they've done is they've gone out like the back entrance of the school. Yeah. And instead of going directly to the youth centre, they have to walk around a bit. And that involves a brief section of Park. That's right. Okay, let's go with that. Yeah. Because otherwise it's some sort of horrible Lovecraftian town where... Like, you take three lefts and you don't end up going right. Yes. You end up going left again. Yes. And now, oh God, we've got to go up this wall. What a, oh, this or in this context, you always end up in a park. Yeah. And there's always, always parties. There's always a park and there's always parties. Uh, so, Bulk and Skull come in at this point. Yep. And uh, Bulk says, this place is crawling with the two things I hate the most. Books and dweebs. <laughs> That's a good Bulk line. It is pretty good. Um, so yeah, Skull's buying a book for his mother. Yep. Uh, he finds a book about Thanksgiving dinner cooking, and Skull uh, Bulk says she's going to need it because I've tasted her cooking. Yeah, this line is basically Bulk saying to Skull that Bulk has slept with Bulk's mother, right? I mean, I find it hard to read it any other way. Yeah. Although there is like the way that Bulk has just had dinner at Bulk and Skull at Skull's house. But the way he says it, it, he says it like a put down. Yes. And I don't think. Your mum can't make dinner. Yeah. You nerd. Yeah, that's not a put down. But saying, I love spending time at your mum's house <laughs> is. <laughs> oh, God. The image of, like, because in my head, Skull's mother is Skull in a wig. Oh, if Skull's mother ever turns up on the show, she will be Skull with a wig. So. Like... <laughs> So, the idea of Bulk and Skull's mother... Yeah. Is, it's just Bulk and Skull. Yeah. That's not... That's not okay. <laughs> Clearly okay for Bulk. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, their plan is... They find this book about monster making. Yep. And their plan is... Well, we make a monster. The Power Rangers come out. We find out who the Power Rangers are. There's a couple of steps in there that I don't think they've thought through. Yes. Namely... All of them. Yes. But specifically, even if they make a monster, how does... Once the Power Rangers show up, how do they unmask them? Yeah, that they have not thought that through. They're superheroes with guns and axes. 
axes and shit. The thing is, they've been around the Power Rangers. Yep. Several times. Yep. That has not led to them uncovering their identities. No. So, I'm just relieved that presumably we're almost at the end of this story out for Vulcan Skull. I mean, at some point they've got to turn into orangutans. <laughs> That's a little while off yet. <laughs> but we've got five more episodes of this season. I'm pretty sure you we don't... You think it's a season-long arc? That is my hope. <laughs> okay. Very strong hope. I mean, their, their first thing was kind of a season-long arc. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Who knows, I guess. All right, so uh, Kimberly and Rocky and Tommy are walking through the park when the book flies out of Kimberly's hands. They're like, why did you throw your book? Yeah, Tommy says to Kimberly, why did you throw the book away? When there was... No one there could have possibly thought that happened. No. Not only because there was giant waves of magic involved in front of their eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I... I mean, what could... Oh, anyway, Tommy's an idiot. Uh, so it goes and it lands in the bin. Yep. And they're all like, oh, I didn't do that. Let's go look at the book. And they get sucked into the book. Dun, dun, dun. Is anyone surprised? Like, no. But I was surprised by the execution. <laughs> okay, so they're inside the book. And inside the book is basically them on a soundstage. With, like, a watercolour background, CG'd yep. behind them. I think CG'd is almost a bit too... Okay, yeah. It's like bad hand-drawn animations stitched in. It's fascinating to look at. Yeah, it is it is fascinating because anything in the background is that, which is extremely stylized and cartoony. Yeah. But anywhere in their, their immediate vicinity... Is it, a prop. Is a prop, is a soundstage. Yeah. And doesn't look like it's hand-drawn. Yeah. So it seems like, in the distance, it looks like a cartoon, but the closer you get to it, the more it becomes a real thing. <laughs> Which sounds awesome, but it's just an artifact of terrible <laughs> production values. Yeah, I mean, the version of this where they spent, like, more than 60 cents yeah. looks great. Yeah. The version of this that we get looks weird and unsettling. And almost like they're using... Like stock animation or something like there's this bit where in the background a reindeer pops its head or like head out looks around fiendishly and disappears yeah that has nothing to do with anything at any point well matt if you don't think that next week's episode has got reindeer saurus i have another thing coming no you're probably correct no, I to be yeah. honest um okay so kim figures out where they are yep they're in the book and they're like, well, let's call Zordon. We should say specifically the Grumble the... Yeah, Grumble the Magic Elf. Yep. Um, they can't call Zordon because books... I don't know, it's another dimension. I'm fine with that. Yep. Uh, I'm not fine with another power of theirs that's been cut off, but we'll get to that one. Yes. Um, so, Matt, who do they meet? Well, clearly, Grumble the Magic Grumpy Elf. So Grumble the Magic Elf yep. uh, is dressed kind of like Santa. Yes. Except his face is very obviously a repainted Mr. Tickle Sneezer. Yes. And what's fascinating to me about this character yep. is that he's in, to, in a Santa costume. Yeah. Santa is a Christmas thing. Yeah. And he's a Jewish caricature. <laughs> like, very much so. He's an upset New York Jew, isn't he? Yes. Yep. Like, very blatantly. And not, like, angry, just constantly disgruntled. Yep. In a way that almost comes off as racist. Matt, that's because an evil magician put a spell on Grumble and made him a grouch. (laughs) (laughs) Made him Jewish. But if he delivers all of the presents, he won't have to be Jewish anymore. I'm just saying... Is that an actual thing in Judaism? Just, <laughs> look, if you told me that in Judaism, if you deliver a bunch of presents, you get to not be a Jew, <laughs> I wouldn't be super shocked. <laughs> uh, yeah, the whole thing just robbed me the, the wrong way, I guess, is what I'm getting at. It's just, it's so weird. Yeah. It's, oh boy. Yeah, so he's got to deliver a bunch of presents to orphans. Yep. And then he can not be a grouch. Yep. I have questions about where the orphans live in this fantasy landscape <laughs> that is dominated by, like, evil ice creatures. They don't need presents. I think they need, like, a fire and protection from ice giants. 
I j- they need thought, is what I'm saying. It's just, it's so weird, even for this show. Yeah. I mean... <sighs> so while this is all going on, there's... Uh, Lord Zed has woken up. Yeah. And he's decided that Rita's actually onto something good this time. He might actually just try and help her out. So he realises that if the presents get delivered, yeah. the story will be over... And that could potentially mean that the Rangers get to leave? Well, here's the thing. As soon as Lord Zed says that, everybody in the universe treats it as an absolute fact. Yes. Including everybody who is not privy to that conversation. Yes. Lord Zed says, well, if he delivers all the presents, the story ends and they get out. Yep. And then everyone goes, well, we have to stop him from delivering all the presents. Is that how stories work? I mean... Does Grumble get to leave as well? Or is he stuck in a perpetual eternal torment of being cursed by a wizard? Yeah, I think if I was the Power Ranger and I heard that, my initial thought would be, okay, so I kill Grumble, his story's over, I get to leave and Grumble is freed from his, like, cyclical Well, no, but if the story can't end, they can't get out. I'm saying that you change the story, though. Yeah, but I, I think that's the thing. They have to reach, like, the last page. I and then see. they if, if the last page is Grumble's decapitated head... Yeah. And, like, a Power Ranger holding it up and going, Now I am Grumble! <laughs> yeah. Then they're stuck there. I, it, it makes no sense. Like, every time I've finished reading a book... Yeah. You know what I haven't been greeted by? Power Rangers. <laughs> no, but, like, I think... It kind of, in children, instills the notion that those worlds are fictional and that those characters don't exist beyond the end of the story. Sure. Which is a shitty thing to implant in the minds of children. Yeah. Like, you should have a sense that the world that you're going into is fully formed and will continue. And when the book says happily ever after, there's a life after that. Sure. Not... Everything reverts back to the start and they have to go through that horrible experience again. Matt, given the overt Christmas theming, and we'll get to a snow world in a bit, yep. would it surprise you to learn that this episode came out at Christmas time? Yes, actually. That's good, because it came out in May. Ah. This is a heavily Christmas-themed episode that was released in the middle of summer. Right. Okay. I'm less surprised by that. Really? Because this is Power Rangers. <laughs> we did just watch... The Power Rangers Dino Charge Halloween episode two weeks before Halloween. Yeah, but two weeks is very different to May. Yeah, I, I understand. I agree. It's just like, and it's, it's not even like it could have been intended as a Christmas special. Yeah. Like, there's, I think since Rangers Back in Time, all those episodes aired post-Christmas. Yeah. So it's not like it's a couple of episodes out of position. It's, it's like way, 20 yeah. episodes too late to have been a Christmas special. Yep. It's very strange. Grumble the magic elf. The magic Jew elf. <laughs> who looks like Mr. Tickle Sneezer. I do feel bad for Rocky in this situation as well. Right. Because he's the third wheel. He's Yeah, the third wheel and would be normally. <laughs> I, in any group of three people, if Rocky's <laughs> one of them, he's the third wheel. <laughs> I'm imagining even if Rocky's on a date with someone and there's <laughs> yeah. an actual third wheel there, <laughs> yeah. Rocky is still like... He becomes a third yeah. wheel. Oh, God. Uh, but it's Kobe, uh, Kobe? Tommy, and Kim Tommy and Kim, and they've just had a moment. Yes. So now he's actually the third wheel. Yeah, he really is. So Lord Zed sent some putties down. Yep. Uh, at which point some helpful Angel Grove High students stumble across this book in a bin. Yep. And proving that no one involved in this show had ever met a teenager in the 90s, they say, why would someone throw away a perfectly good book? Yeah, they scoop the book out of the bin to take it back to the fair, which seems nice if you think about it for a second, but then you think about it for three seconds and you realise they've fished a book out of a bin <laughs> and are taking it to school to be sold. <laughs> Oh, That's super like gross. Sorry? You don't like a bin book? I prefer my bins to not be bin books. Like, if I have a choice. Right. Oh, yeah, so they're going to take it back to Miss Appleby so she can sell it at the fair. Yep. Which so, she does. <laughs> Someone out there ends up with a bin book. Yeah, so uh, the putties come, and yep. then the kids have taken the book. 
So they chase after them, and look, eventually they get close enough to get zapped into the book. I, it's so strange that I expected that the putties would have to steal the book. Yep. And that that was a complication they were setting yep. up. But no. No, they just get close. There's no actual complication here. It's no. not a problem for it's the It's a time filler, not a like, narrative device. And there's a lot of these very strange time fillers in this episode. Yeah. One in particular we'll get to in a moment. All right, so Tommy tries to reason with Grumble the elf. Yeah. <laughs> which, look, I've said some weird shit on this podcast. I was not expecting to say that one. He says, Mr. Grumble, you don't know how important this is to us. And Mr. Grumble's like, hey, fine, whatever. Oh, you may something. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, now they're walking through, like, a forest. And Grumble's dragging his pre- presence. Yep. And then the putties show up. And are just, like, fucking around? Yeah, I have no idea what this is supposed to be. Right? They're hiding near the presents, but instead of stealing them, they start doing roly-polies on the ground. Yeah. For no reason. Lord Zed seems frustrated by this. Yep. But not surprised. <laughs> In the past, the putties haven't always succeeded. Yep. But they've never not done exactly what they're told. Yep. There's been no indication to me that they have to be wrangled in any way. Yeah. But here, they do roly-polies, and then Lord Zed is like, oh, this is really, like, shitting me off. I need to zap them to get them going again. So he <sighs> sends lightning into the storybook to give them a jolt. Yeah, it... I have a question. Yeah. Can't he just, like, electrocute Tommy and the others? <laughs> if he could just shoot lightning into the book... And they can't morph, I as mean, we learn later. If he can just shoot lightning from the sky, he could. Ju- they're outside a lot. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. The, the, so this doesn't serve to progress anything at all. No. It's not returned to at any point. No. It's just any possible excuse to fill two pages. If you wanted to say, like. Because they're in the storybook, sure. they become like storybook antagonists who yep. fuck around. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. Except they're about to fight a yeti. Yep, and he throws rocks and like punches you in the face. Yeah, so he's out to wreck them. <laughs> that's clearly not the rules. Yeah, this show is insane, yes. and this episode is even more insane than the regular insaneness of this show. Yeah. So the putties then grab the presents and teleport away? Yeah. Whether it's outside the book or... Inside the book. And if inside the book, why inside the book? And if outside the book, then the Power Rangers are actually just fucked now? Yeah. Do they just set the presents on fire? (laughs) When the presents come out of the book, are they still presents? And if so, does that mean... Lord Zed could just start picking, like, yetis up out of books and using them? He should just go to a library and just borrow, like, Dracula. Yeah! And just... Just unleash Dracula. If what it turns out is that Lord Zed can actually pull monsters from books, he has been going about this entirely the wrong way. Yeah. Just find, (laughs) like, an alien novelization and make him find a xenomorph. Like... Yeah. Or, like, just, like, find some Lovecraft... Yeah. I'm like, here you go. Here's some Elder Gods. Universe over. I win. <sighs> this sh- Oh, God. We're, we're not even, like, halfway. No. There's, oh, God. So, Bulk and Skull are trying to make a monster, and then they don't have batteries, and then Bulk leaves. Yeah. I'm very curious about what sort of monster they're making, and why it needs batteries. Because as you're saying, for... It could be a monster costume. Yep. Or it could be anything else. Yep. If it needs batteries, it's probably not just an outfit. Yep. So are they making a robot? (laughs) I mean, I I hope so. Maybe it's got, like, glowy eyes or, like... Sure, okay. You know, maybe, but... Uh, Speaking of horror characters, though... Yeah. Skull is decked out like, you know, stereotypical Dr. Frankenstein. Yep. It's pretty great. It is pretty great. Yeah. What's not pretty great is the five-minute slapstick sequence. Yeah. Where he lost the book. Yes, I guess. And then he runs around his little shed. Yeah. 
and bumps into things and get his head his head caught in a suction cup. And there's and like an eye on like a thing. What is that? What is, is that, that part of the monster? <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> or is it just like a weird like animated tube that he keeps in his shed? And if so, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ. Did Skull accidentally create sentient like AIs? But he's too stupid to realise it and keeps them in his shed because he doesn't understand them. Anyway, so the other rangers go looking for Rocky and Tommy and Kimberly. Yep. And they go to they go back to Miss Appleby and they say, hey, Have you seen Tommy and Kimberly? And then Adam goes, Or oh, Rocky? <laughs> like Rocky is clearly not the you know <laughs> Have you seen, you know, Tommy and Kim who we like? Or I guess like if you've seen Rocky. Because if Rocky's there, Tom and Kim might be as yeah, well. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> they were together. So I guess if we find Rocky, we'll find the rest of them. Yeah. It, uh, it'll be worth finding Rocky if we're able to get Tommy and Kimberly back. So no, she hasn't, but she knows they left. On the topic of noticing something is missing. Yeah. Did you notice that Billy isn't wearing his glasses? He or? isn't. I don't know if that's going to be a regular thing. So I know that. David Yost hated the glasses. Right. And they kept telling him to wear the glasses because no, nerds wear glasses. Yep. I'm and with it, them so far. And he just kept taking the glasses off. Right. To the point where they gave up trying to force him to wear glasses and Billy just stopped wearing glasses. I mean, that seems reasonable. Yeah. And I, I'm curious when it happened because I, I feel like it's been happening for a while and I haven't noticed it. I feel like recently there's probably, and I'm sure someone will go back and tell us, I feel like it's probably been, like, sometimes with glasses and sometimes without glasses. Yeah. Depending on how much someone was willing to argue with him. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't care either way. The character is established enough now that he doesn't need the glasses to be like, hey, that's the dorky one. No, and he's much less, like, overalls and glasses bubbling, like, blah, sort of yeah. character. And much more capable now. Hmm. So He got contacts. Yeah. yeah. They're, like... Two inches thick, because he had terrible glasses. Yes. All right, so... uh, The rangers who are inside the book are now in, like, a cold winter area. Yeah. What happened to the elf? Uh, Matt, I don't... I don't know. You don't... Okay. I just wanted... I thought maybe I missed something. No, I don't... I don't know. Okay. Um, so they're cold. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, a yeti shows up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, speaking of monsters that are clearly other monsters, yep. this is Reflectorilla, or whatever he was called, yep. but painted white and blue. Yeah, with a wig on top of his head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't mind the, like, costume reuse. It's... This is much more effective than the other one. <laughs> I mean, we say that, Yeah, but, re- like, Mr. Tickle Caesar was in episode six or seven. That's true, that was a like, long time It's ago. only because we loved slash hated him so much. Yeah. I feel like if you didn't have particularly strong memories of Mr. Tickle Sneezer, yeah. it's not a terrible elf costume. Yeah, that's probably true. Other than it looks a little dumb. He also, like, can't talk. No. The mouth doesn't move. And he's a, one of the costumes that very clearly has a mouth that's meant for talking that doesn't work. Yeah. That kind of throws you a bit. Yeah. Uh, so this snow monster just starts fucking him up. Oh, yeah. Just ripping into them. Throwing boulders. He just runs into Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. So they decide to morph. Yeah, it's morphin' time, Michael. They can't morph, Matt. Oh, it's not morphin' time. Now, here is an acceptable explanation for why they can't morph. Yes. Uh, They're inside a storybook. Yeah, morphin' grid does not exist in the The regular rules don't work while they're in there. It's why they can't contact Zordon, because they can't tap into their powers. Yep. Is that the explanation the show uses, Matt? Oh, my, no. Why can't they morph, Matt? They got a bit cold. Sorry? They got a bit cold. Yeah, it's too cold to morph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't Lord Z just send monsters to the Arctic, Matt? <laughs> Don't know. What do you mean it's too cold to morph? I think what they the, It's not that quite. It's that the morphers themselves have frozen up. Like yeah, it, Matt, they're experiencing hypothermal malfunction. Yeah. It's too cold to morph. Yeah. It's um, it's a bit of a design oversight. Just make snow monsters. Yeah. Boom. Job done. Yeah. Oh my god. What the fuck do you mean? It's too cold to morph. 
I, I'm with you. What? <laughs> I think I would mind this so much if, as he said, there wasn't already a very obvious and valid way right? to have this happen. You know, it's like, oh, you're in a storybook, you can't morph because there's no Power Rangers in the story. It's like you couldn't morph when you were in the past. Yeah. Because... There was no Zordon, even though there should have been a Zordon anyway. Yeah. Like, I'm open to the idea that you cannot always morph because sometimes your connection to the morphing grid is severed or doesn't work properly. Yeah. But it's too cold to morph. It's a it's a it's a bad one. <laughs> it's too cold. <laughs> anyway, so they can't morph. They can't morph because it's too cold. The other three rangers have managed to get in touch with Zordon. Yeah. And have gone to the command centre. Yeah. Although the rangers inside the book can't contact anyone else, it appears that using the computer systems, Billy and Zordon are able to lock down the signal. Yeah, Billy brings them up on the viewing globe. Because I guess inside every book is actually like a pocket dimension where the events of the book take place. Apparently. And Zordon says... (laughs) Once he's tracked out in the signal, oh, they're in a book. He says, like, yeah, the signal tells me they're in the middle of a storybook. Yeah. But I cannot figure out which book it is. Yeah. He says it like it's no big deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this signal, let's see, uh, they're not in space. They're not in another domain. Oh, I'm getting storybook is the marker at the top. So uh, they're in the middle of a storybook. No. <laughs> I want to know what this like sister reads like because that's such an abstract notion yeah is, is it, it like just... okay no it doesn't look like they've been turned into pasta <laughs> um, they're certainly not existing within a giant metaphor of like an existential crisis uh storybook yeah oh I... <laughs> <laughs> hang in there michael it's not like <sighs> one of them could recognize the book and they'd be like, hey, that's that book that Kimberly was telling us about. Yeah. Or... But this is what we are talking about with Kyle earlier, right? Like, it's just... They, they get themselves into these situations where they write terrible things that had obvious solutions that were better, but take the terrible ones anyway. And I don't, I don't know why. The signal tells me they're in the middle of a storybook. The middle... <laughs> There's a different signal for the start and end of a storybook. Yeah. And so if you're in the middle of the story... Yeah. Does that mean that... Does that relate to your physical location? Like, can you not reach certain places within the world unless you've had emotional developments that correspond with the needs of the story? The idea of narrative as mapped on a physical space is terrifying, and I don't think we can get into it. But I'm fast... Like, this, this is the stuff that I live for, Michael. Like, like is there... A, let's take a different story, because we don't know what this story is. Yeah. Like, is Tatooine different? Can you not get from, like, Skywalker Homestead Tatooine yeah. to Jabba's Tatooine? Yeah. Until you've been to Hoth? I think it's more like you can't leave Tatooine until you've realised that your life on Tatooine isn't what you need. Right. And that you have bigger things meant for you. You know? I mean, yes. So, like, if the Power Rangers ended up on Tatooine... Yeah. Don't tease me, man. (laughs) They'd first have to figure out... Why, as people, emotionally, to develop their need to leave Tatooine before they could leave Tatooine? And then at what point do they have to deliver the presents to the orphans? I mean, I haven't quite figured that out. I'm going to need a little more time. <laughs> that's now. the Star Wars Christmas special, right? <laughs> yeah. That's on what... Life Day is when you have to do <laughs> yeah. that. That's on Kashyyyk, not Tatooine. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, God. All right, so... I'm Rita... going to think about this a lot more now. <laughs> Rita and Lord Zed on the moon yep. say, whoever thought Balkan Skull would play right into our hands? And if we can be honest, All it's people. not that out of the question. No. no one's shocked. So they go like, you know, we need a monster. I guess we'll... they've made a monster. Yeah, and this is a big problem for them. It's, I mean, how do they get monsters already? Yeah, wouldn't it be useful if... They knew someone who could create monsters, or they could turn literally anything into a monster. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great if they just had, like, one guy who could take, like, just clay 
for example. Yeah, just put it through some sort of machine, yeah. maybe. Yeah, boom, monster. But no. Or, you know, say that guy's overworked, he doesn't want to do it. Yep. Imagine if they had a magical staff yep. that they could just find anything a lo- as long as it's alive, but also maybe not, yep. and just turn that into a monster. That'd be cool too. I, I guess they're just being lazy. <laughs> yeah. To, like, that's the thing. Yeah. On this point, I kind of don't mind it. Because I've been there, you know, yeah. it's like, I don't even want to have to think about what thing I'm going to turn into a monster. It's there. It's I'm ready just going to turn a monster just, into a monster. Just yep. do it. Yep. Oh. It's weird when Rita and Lord Zed say bulk and skull. Yes. Like, something about those circles of the world, as soon as they mix, like when Rita came and she was an action figure. Yes. It just... I don't know if that's, like bad writing and they should be able to mix and interact or if because they're just like one's comedy and bumbling and high school drama I think it's because the bulk and skull stuff is always so low stakes yes their stories if things go wrong which they always do nothing's a problem yeah but as soon as you involve them with characters who were ostensibly trying to murder people. Yeah, if Rita and Lord Zed turn this monster that's in their shed into a monster... Yes. It's going to kill them first. Yes. I mean, it's not. No. But, oh, no. but that's kind of the implication of linking those two parts yeah. of the of the myth. Yeah. So, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, alright. So, uh, back in the storybook, Snow Monster makes an avalanche. Yes. Although, not really. I mean... <laughs> Look, the camera shakes and it gets a lot wider. Yes. As far as making a fake avalanche on 30 cents, it's a pretty good, like... Yeah, it's fine. They do feel almost like they're in danger. Yes. And then that's the end of the episode. Yeah. <laughs> what the I mean, fuck? I hope you didn't come to Power Rangers for Power Rangers or Zords, because we don't got none of those here. No Sentai footage at all in this one. Nope. No Power Rangers, importantly. Yeah, well, but they couldn't morph because it was too cold. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. Do you want to put any of these monsters on the creature feature this week? Not yet. Okay. I feel like I agree. we're probably going to see more of them. I feel like we're definitely going to see Grumble the elf again. Yes. Yeah, they've got to do something to beat this snow monster. Who I think is just called Snow Monster? That would not surprise me. Alright, Michael. We have a ranking system for our episodes. Yeah. Rocky, Aisha, or Adam, yeah. representing bad, okay, and great. Yeah. Where does it fall? This is like... This is like Orico. This is so weird yes. that it's an alien from another planet who can only breathe water. Yes. It's like... It, it defies our ranking system. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like nothing we've ever seen on this show. Yeah. And parts of it are appallingly terrible. Yes. But it's all played so earnestly... Yes. ...that you kind of have to go, hey, they tried something. Yes. Yeah, to me, maybe that's why I think it should sit in the middle of the spectrum. Sure. Because it's so bad, but at least it's different, and I applaud that. Yeah. So, Aisha? Yeah, all right. Okay, in the middle of of our spectrum. Yeah. No one on the creature feature, so that's pretty much it for this episode. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see what happens next week. Yeah, or we could just skip to the end. No. We can't do that. We have to go through this story, Michael. If someone was reading the storybook, and they just read the last page, do things in that universe progress instantly? Well, I have questions about, like, if you opened up the book now... Are they inside the book? Are there little pictures of them? Yeah. And I feel like they're going to be when the other Power Rangers find the book next week. Yeah. But what happens if you rip out a page? Where are the presents? How are they going to... I. It's raised so many questions that we will never get even terrible answers to, let alone satisfactory answers. Yeah. I would like to take this moment now... Yeah. ...to offer a recommendation to our listeners. Okay. We had Kyle on. We talked a bit about the world of comics, which I dearly love. Yeah. Uh... If you love comics like I love comics, and you're also interested in the idea of how stories could relate to the real world... And you haven't had that beaten out of you by the insanity of this week's episode. Yes. I highly recommend a comic series called The Unwritten. Yep. uh, Written by... 
Oh, I've had a bone blank. I'm sorry. Wow. Uh, I love The Unwritten. I, I think oh, it's been a long day. Uh, it is written by Mike Carey. Thank you. Who wrote Lucifer for Vertigo in the early 2000s. That's right. Uh, the Unwritten is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's actually just finished recently, and it is, from start to finish, absolutely fantastic, and I highly recommend it. All right. Yeah. So that has been... This week's episode of Ranger Danger. Yes. I feel weird. Yeah. Highs and lows. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess we'll be back next week with Storybook Rangers Part 2. We're so close to the end of this season. Yeah. That's what, Before we go, I just wanted to talk very briefly yeah. about how in this episode, Rita and Lord Zed were a team mm. and they liked each other. Yep. And it was weird. Yeah. And kind of nice, because the status quo will be changing again shortly with the change of the seasons. Will it? Somewhat. I have absolutely no idea what's coming up. I'm really like, excited about it. Until that. we get to Turbo, yeah. and Divatox has a spaceship in the middle of a lake. Yeah. Like, I... You know a bit. I but... know these, like, robot bad guys at some point. Yeah. And, I, I yeah, I've... I've got nothing. I'm really excited that we're get- I hope you do your best to keep yourself that way I'm as well. trying very hard, yep. so uh, we'll see. Yeah. Because historically, you've had a bit more insight into what's coming up than I have. Yeah. And I think the tables are about to turn. So, yeah, th- things won't quite be this way with Lord Zed and Rita soon. So it was nice for them to have a moment after all this time of like, hey, we're married, we can be a team, and we can enjoy each other. They've been doing some therapy. Yeah. Finster totally does like a couple's counselling. Or he's dead and that's why they're happy. They just had all this rage inside them just murdered Finster. That's why they needed monsters. Poor Finster. Yeah. Yeah. I hope Finster's not dead. They're bad people, Michael. Aww. Alright, well on that incredibly sad note, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Have a good week. Unlike Finster. <laughs>